Hello folks, welcome back to World War 2 TV and we are continuing our week of kind of a random selection of shows that aren't particularly to a theme, but this one, we have kind of covered this subject subject ahead already, or in that we have covered in various shows the Battle for France in 1940, we've also co uh, covered of course the Dunkirk evacuation. But after Dunkirk, there were still tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of British troops left in France and civilians, and they were also rescued. And we will find all about that uh, today with our guest, David Warsfold. Just before I bring him in, if you are new to the channel, and if you're not new to the channel, if you haven't clicked the little button to subscribe, why haven't you done it yet? Please do it so you get the notifications. Consider becoming a patron, consider becoming a YouTube channel member. And as always, all the information you need is in the pull down description on YouTube, the links to my guests' books, their websites, my, my social media accounts, their social media accounts, and all the things you would need. So often I put links in there to shows that are on a similar subject that you may want to watch if you haven't seen it already after this one. So that's my kind of housekeeping done. I'm going to bring my guest in now. So David Warsfold. So good evening, David. How are you today? I'm fine. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Thank you. So as I said, Operation Dynamo Dunkirk kind of needs an introduction. Everybody knows about that. It's movies. It's It's been on TV. Loads of numerous anniversaries. It's been covered. The little ships, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there was this massive operation that happened afterwards that I guess because it didn't localize to one particular area doesn't get quite the the, um, the attention. But before we dive into that, tell me, David, what your background is and how you discovered uh, about Oper Operation Ariel and, and the process to it becoming a book. Um, well, yeah, my background is, uh, is, a, is a journalist. I've been a financial journalist now for for 40 years, but obviously I've always had a deep interest in, in history, particularly uh, Second World War history, and um, and Dunkirk in particular, because uh, my father was a driver with the British Expeditionary Force, went over there in October 1939, and he came back through Dunkirk. So it, it's a part phase of the war I'd always read up on and focused on. Like most Brits, um, <clears throat> I thought left Dunkirk, June the 4th it fell, and that was largely the end of our involvement in, in France in June 1940. Uh, when I researched a book on my wife's uh, maternal uh, grandfather, uh, who was an Irishman from Galway, who spent 50 years in, in a British uniform, the books Fighting for the Empire came out about uh, five or six years ago. Um, <clears throat> he... Uh, when he was 70, uh, which is 1940, he was on a ship. He was a ship surgeon. He was a doctor. He was a ship surgeon on a ship that went into Bordeaux in the middle of June 1940. And uh, I thought, well, that's a bit odd. Uh, what, what, why were we still sending ships into French ports uh, well into June? And I tried to find a book that explained uh, exactly what was going on. And I couldn't find a book. And that's when I promised myself it was a gap I would try and fill. Well, exactly. And as it's, it's something I, I mentioned to you before we went live, that I wrote a book about uh, the church in Angavilla Plan uh, in 1944. But earlier I found out the British troops went through that part of Normandy in 1940 on their way to Cherbourg. And I have to say, when I found out about that, I was like yourself, it was like, I hadn't quite realized the extent of, of how big this was. I knew a little bit about San Nazaire, but I didn't know the extent of yeah. it. So we'll find out about it now. And just... When you just about the research process, um, you know, when you're tackling something after Dunkirk, um, what was there plenty of archival information, or did did a lot of it kind of stop after, as you said, there after the last boat had got off the mole at Dunkirk and kind of people got bored with the subject, or was there a lot that, uh, to discover? Oh, there, there's a massive amount to discover. So it's worth saying that there there are a couple of very good military histories uh, which you know tell you about. You know, the, the, the army units that were still in France um, at that time and uh, you know, what they did and how they got to the port. So they, they tend to stop when they get to the port and say, well, they got on the ship and they got home. Um, and there's so they're, and they're, you know, they're, they're decent, solid, authoritative military histories. They're, what, there are a couple of books that uh, deal with the naval side of it um and you know and they've got some fantastic lists of of the ships that are involved there's also of course in the national archives 
you know a wealth of of material. There, you know, there, you know, there are files and files on Operation Ariel. There are the uh, obviously the war diaries of the units that are involved. And obviously, what are not there are the civilian stories. Mm. Yeah, they, they, I mean, as I explain as we go through, you know, there were. 20, 25,000 British civilians in the Low Countries, in Belgium and Holland and in France, when when the Germans attacked on May the 10th. And Dunkirk was almost exclusively a, a military evacuation. Um, you know, the civilians were really just told to go south and hope for the best. And it was finding those stories that was the real challenge. Um, you know, some people have been wonderful. You know, they've pointed me to, you know, diaries. Uh, they've sent me, you know, letters, uh, postcards, all sorts of things. Because I wanted to tell the story as far as I could through the voices of people that had been involved. So, you know, getting that original source material, it, it was was so important. No, definitely. And as as mm. we will find out, it's a subject that we could expand on each fa each mm. part of your talk we could expand that into a half an hour, 45 yeah. minutes alone. So what we're doing tonight, folks, is a kind of a good, broad overview for those who don't know about it, and then we can maybe expand on it in future shows. But I'll, David has come, uh, as all my guests have, do, power, armed with a PowerPoint, which we'll put up on screen. He will take us through this. So we'll do, <laughs> folks, we'll kind of do questions as we go along. If there's any kind of broad questions about the, you know, the general goings on in 1940, we can do them at the end, perhaps. But we'll do the the ones appropriate to the slides they go on because it does kind of break down to various select sections but i'm gonna basically hand over to david now to take us through this and uh we can all sit back and, and enjoy so over to you david okay thanks very much right so churchill's second miracle of deliverance as i was just saying dunkirk was far from the end of the story there's this wonderfully precise figure of 338,226 evacuated through Dunkirk. Uh, I have got an analysis of all of the, the figures in the back of the book. It, uh, yeah, it, it's a slightly spurious figure. No, no one really knows the exact figure, but the, it's there or thereabouts. <clears throat> what we often don't realise is 100,000 of those were French troops, and almost all of those were immediately returned to France. And indeed, most of them never touched English soil. They were just shipped further down the coast to continue the fight against the advancing Germans. Before Dynamo kicked in, nearly 30,000 had already been evacuated um, you know, through Boulogne, Calais and, and Dieppe. Dieppe at that stage still being designated as the, um, as the medical evacuation point um, and thus was at that stage protected from a German attack. Dunkirk fell on the 4th of June, and as I was saying before, you know, my father came back through Dunkirk, and it, like most Brits, I thought that was largely the end of it. Every time we watch an episode of Dad's Army with that graphic at the beginning with those little swastikas swishing across the north of France, they, they reinforce this impression because they force that little Union Jack back across the channel. Mm -hmm. And you, you look at that, and actually, really, there should be another Union Jack stuck south of that German advance because there were hundreds of thousands of troops still left in France. Another thing that's important to understand in the context of this is that the Norway evacuations did not finish until after Dunkirk. People often say, have asked me, well, why didn't the, the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, um, interfere much more with the evacuation from Dunkirk and the later evacuations? The simple answer is it was still largely preoccupied in Norway. Um, the Norway campaign is often painted as, you know, as a failure, as often as a folly almost. But what it did actually inflict quite significant damages on the Kriegsmarine and made them very cautious about uh, taking on the Royal Navy. Uh, so it, you know, it plays a part in the background in this story. So you know, during the rest of 1940, over 200,000 military personnel, most of them British, but not exclusively, there were two large Polish divisions and a large Czech division operating in France that were cut off south of the Somme as well. And in total, almost 50,000 civilians about half of them from France and half from the Channel Islands. So in total, during that period, those period from the beginning of May through to the end of June 1940, 
well over half a million people, near 600,000 people were evacuated from France. It, it, you know, it, it, I mean, it's a phenomenal achievement, however you look at it. So what was going on? Well, the Germans attacked on, on May the 10th through the Ardennes, called everyone on the hop, bypassed the Maginot Line, as, as I'm sure you've covered many times before in uh, your uh, broadcast, Paul. And what happened is the tank divisions, the panzers, with, with um, the gun ho Rommel at the helm, advanced along the line of the Somme. And you can see it on the map there. Um, and he was determined to get to the coast, and he did. And by getting to the coast, he effectively cut the British expeditionary force in two. Roughly two-thirds of it was cut off north, and they were primarily the front-line fighting troops. South of the Somme were what we call the lines of communication units, um, often uh, undervalued, I think, in, in wartime histories. Um, no, no army could operate without its lines of communication. Well, we've seen it again recently in, in Ukraine. I mean, the Russians overstretched their supply lines. They, they, they went too far too fast. And, and couldn't support their frontline units. So, you know, lines of communication are, are vitally important, and they include all the, you know, essential support, the medical services and, you know, the, uh, you know, the pay corps, the, the cooks, the chefs, as well as, you know, those who move the munitions up to the front line. But they were largely cut off south of this, this advance. Of course, wrapped up in this is the, Again, I bet this is something you've covered many times. Is the famous halt order of twenty fourth of May, um, which is uh, which I cover in the book, which is much debated um, because there was a British counter attack and a French counter. De Gaulle, the name you'll see on the map there, because at this stage was a was a tank French tank commander. Um, it, it, following that, you know, weeks later, he moved into uh, the French government and eventually broke away. But um, you know, there was an attempt to cut the German lines, um, but it, the level of communication between the British and the French uh, was, was not what it should have been. If they'd have both, in my view is quite simply, if they'd have both attacked one from the north and one from the south at the same point, they would have cut the German lines. And I think if you read the, uh, the, the German records, and I've tried to reflect some of that in the book, you know, the Wehrmacht was, was very worried uh, by, by this attempt to cut their advance. And you know, that's what fueled the debate about the Holt order. And, and just to jump in there for a second, David, I think you made a good point referencing the Dad's Army graphic opening graphic there is that when we see any kind of documentary showing that kind of carpet of Nazi red sweeping mm. over Europe, we do forget that that wasn't quite how it was behind it. In as you said there, the front units are maybe engaging and pushing the British back, but it's not that, like the entire German army is sweeping behind. There are huge gaps throughout France mm. where the German, as you say, the rear columns have not got yet, which I suppose yeah. is, is sowing the seeds for how aerial is able to be mm. possible. And I think we're, we're influenced by that kind of sweeping red, implying that, that every single village behind that advance has now somehow got a German headquarters and swastikas flying and, and German troops. And, of course, nothing can be further from the truth. Yeah, I mean, the Germans were struggling to to, to keep their supply lines um, functioning. I mean, it may, may surprise people, but a, a, a lot of the, uh, the, the the German transport was actually still horse-drawn. Yeah. Um, it, it, their, their lines of communication were not as mechanised as ours were. Uh, and you're going know, that you know that's part of the background to the debate about uh, you know why that Hitler authorized the Holt order. Their supply lines were struggling. You know the tanks were having to stop overnight uh, to wait for the petrol supplies to to catch up. Uh, so you know, it, it really is it's important that people understand that because it uh, you know creates the context for what happened afterwards. So that's where we were. Dunkirk fell. Um, so what happened after that? Well, the first thing that happened um, was the French came up with this, this plan to create a Breton redoubt. Um, and this appealed to Churchill. He, he, he was really very keen on the idea of keeping a foothold in France. And you'll see on the map, 
that that dark line that runs from Somala through Rings, Nantes, and on to Saint Nazaire, that was going to be the the defence line for this Breton redoubt. And so enthused was Churchill by this that the Canadian First Division, which had arrived in in Britain uh, only a couple of weeks before, was promptly dispatched um, along with uh, another Scottish division to you know, reinforce the French. Uh, units that were going to form the defensive line on the Breton Redoubt. Um, the, the plan collapsed very quickly. Um, the French got cold feet. Their military commanders said the the line was far too long to to defend. Um, that you know, there were not enough troops available to uh, you know, to make it secure, and it, it collapsed. So actually, no sooner than all those troops arrived, then we had to launch. Uh, a rescue operation for them, which was called Operation Cycle, which ran uh, for two or three days between the 11th and 13th of June. And that brought back 14,500 British and about 1,000 French troops. And Le Havre was the uh, uh, the main focus of, th of that evacuation. And that's a, a little operation squeezed between dynamo and aerial that often gets overlooked. As all this was going on, and there are a number of reasons why the post-Dunkirk story doesn't get told quite as frequently um, as the Dunkirk story. Uh, uh, one of those reasons is, I mean, you know, Dunkirk was, uh, I mean, Churchill said, we, you know, we must be careful not to, um, you know, to paint this de defeat as a, as a victory, but it, you know, it was a moral boosting, morale boosting moment for you know the beleaguered British public at the time. Uh, what happened afterwards contains some disasters, and one of those was the the loss of the Highland Division, which really was a crack fighting unit. And you know, I mean, you know, included the Black Watch and you know the Sutherland Highlands, all those famous. Scottish reg regiments, and as you see on the map there, what happened is as 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 the Germans swung through the rest of, of northern France after the fall of um, of Dunkirk, that um, they got trapped at Saint Valery. Um, part of the, some of them managed to move slightly to one side. Arc force was. Um, contained some of the Highland Division units, plus some of the, the fighting units that have been sort of rapidly, hastily reformed into to a new division. Uh, they managed to get uh, to one side of the German advance, but they they got trapped. Um, they had been the Highland Division had been uh, positioned behind the Maginot Line because obviously that's where the British and the French thought the the Germans would attack initially. Um, when that didn't happen, they that they had a long, arduous evacuation all the way through France. Um, and they ended up here. Um, they were going to be part of the Breton Redoubt um, defence force, but as, as I said, they got cut off by the advance of, uh, of Rommel's tanks when they swung north from the Somme. And, and they got trapped. Um, 11,000 were captured. <sighs> I mean, there are some people that say uh, yeah, that, that Churchill deliberately sacrificed the Highland Division in order to impress the French. I, 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 I find that very hard to stand up myself. If you look at what happened, uh, you know, there were a series of misfortunes. There was the inevitable breakdown of communication between the British and the French, although one flank... Um, of the uh, the Highland Division's retreat was defended by um, <clears throat> one of the the, the French divisions, um, uh, but you know there were breakdowns of communication. They probably withdrew slightly too too slowly. But, you know, I mean, you you, you, you know, it, it was you know, it, you know, it's the noise of war. You can't really criticize anyone from that. Least of all the commander of the Highland Division. But by the time they got to Saint Valery, um, the um, I and mean, there's the memorial, but you can you can see the harbour in the background there. The Germans were on the cliffs, um, making daylight evacuation from the harbour absolutely impossible. But a large um, flotilla of ships was put together to lift the Highland Division, and enough ships were sent to lift them. 
Unfortunately, the night they arrived, there was thick fog and um, there was, uh, yeah, they, the ships didn't know, well, I have compatible radio equipment. You know, the, the, what I'm saying is there are a series of, of mishaps and mistakes in the, in the fog of war, if you'll forgive the pun, um, that, that, that led to them, them being trapped and not being able to get them off. Um, and you know, they, they had to surrender. Uh, they they really it, had no option. It's there. worth mentioning, David. We we did a show about the Royal Scots Fusiliers last year, and that we, I'm I'm planning another one about some of the actions of the 51st High Division. Is that is that in all this discussion of the Churchill and the kind of politics behind it, which, as you say, is ongoing, and people are, and I don't believe there's any deliberate, you know, slight by Churchill, but it does keep being discussed. It keeps mm -hmm. going round and round. Is what it does is it overshadows the really brave actions, the really commendable bits of fighting the 51st units did individually, regiment by regiment, battalion by battalion. And it, it will become just this debate about politics, which I think is over overlooking the important thing of just, yes, they, as you, as you said, they were lost, but they, boy, did they go down fighting. Yeah, they did. And they had no option but to surrender. I, I mean, I personally think the argument that Churchill deliberately sacrificed them, I just said, I don't think it stands up. Yeah. I mean, why, oh, why, oh, why would he sacrifice one of the elite fighting units of the British Army when he knew that within weeks uh, he might be having to defend his own coast from German invasion? Uh, yeah, it, you look at it in those terms, the, yeah. it defies logic to think that he would have deliberately sacrificed them. I said, if you look at it, if you piece together you know, the the military records and put those alongside the naval records, you can see this series of mishaps, misfortunes, miscommunications that led to them being trapped. Um, and uh, so I, 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 I don't buy into the, uh, you know, the, the, the conspiracy theory that they were, uh, they, yeah. they were sacrificed, but it overshadows, as you say, Paul, rightly say, it overshadows um, uh, you know the, the, their, their their bravery. Because one of the great things was, and it, uh, you you mentioned um, uh, you know, one of the units that that retreated through Cherbourg. I, I think that unit was allowed to liberate Cherbourg when it um, uh, when we uh, came back to France in 1944. The the high the reformed Highland Division was allowed to liberate Saint Valery um, when mm. when we went back into France. Uh, which I, 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 you know, I think is, it must have been a great moment for them. It must have been fantastic. Yeah, a, bit like the, a bit like MacArthur allowing the guys he left behind on Bataan to go back there and be part of the surrender yeah. in 45. Some of those moments that, that actually humanise the, 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 you know, the commanders and the British Army in that they do want to kind of give a bit of a sense of closure yeah. to modern yeah. work for these units. But... Um, yeah, anyway, brilliant stuff. Um, uh, the, the 51st High Division, I'm getting loads of requests in the sidebar to, to tackle this subject more, so I will definitely expand. I will get, I will work on it, folks. I'm, well, it's, I'm it, it, it's, yeah, it's a great debate as well. Anyway, so cracking on. So after cycle, June the 15th, there are still tens of thousands of, of troops uh, stuck in France. An operation area was, was launched. Bring them home was the... Uh, uh, the, the order from Whitehall. So the original plans, and I hope the map there is uh, you know, not too small for everyone to see. Oh, he's blown it up. <laughs> Take me out of the picture. That's good. Um, yeah. It so the original plan. So you know, La Havre, Cherbourg, had, had, and Saint Malo by that time had, had gone. They'd fallen. Was to take it down as far as Saint Nazaire. Up to up the uh, the uh, to Nantes, um, with La Rochelle um, as or La Palice, the, the actual porters, as as a backup in, to be used in case of absolute necessity only. That's what it says in the orders. These are all large deep water ports. That's why they they were chosen, and because they could bring thousands out um, at the same time. Um, almost immediately, La Rochelle was being used. Um, the, you know, the whole thing was very fast moving. As well as the British units here, there were two large Polish divisions and a Czech division also in France. And they they, they proved elusive over the next few weeks because they kept moving down the coast. And the, 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 um, the, the naval commanders kept being told, send ships to bring the Poles back. And by the time they got down the Biscay coast, the Poles had gone further south. Uh, but we'll catch up with them in a minute. And, of course, there were the British civilians. Um 
before so Marlow fell, there one of the reasons why the post Dunkirk story doesn't resonate as much as the Dunkirk is because you don't have the little ships, you don't have the romance of the little ships. But there were 20 small ships involved, and they uh, they went from Jersey to Saint Malo, primarily to lift the the demolition crews. And the stories of the demolition crews are, I mean, they're absolutely fantastic. You know, they went in to obviously inflict as much damage on the ports before they fell to the Germans. Almost all of them had incredible arguments with the French, which you can actually have some sympathy with. I mean, the French were quite obstructive. They didn't want their, their port facilities blown up. And actually, you can understand why, because... Obviously, they knew that within days they were going to be having to look the Germans in the eye and so explain why you let the British blow up the port. Yeah. Um, and that was not going to be a comfortable conversation. So I mean, you, you've got to have a bit of sympathy for them. Uh, and San Marlo was no different. They were <clears throat> negotiated up to the last minute. And all the commanders of the demolition crews were told to negotiate with the French up to the point where the negotiations couldn't go any further and then they were given permission to, to to do what they could to disable the port facilities. So they did that, um, but um, the Germans were too close for the larger ships to go in and get them. So 20 small ships volunteered from Jersey, and that's a picture there of one of them, the Diana, which is now in the National Maritime uh, Museum, the, the, the Jersey Maritime Museum in St. Helier. Um, <clears throat> I have to tell you, my, my mother-in-law um, was brought up in Jersey um, before the war. She's still alive. She's 101. Um, wow. And um, she she used to go on that before the war. When my <laughs> wife and I were taken on a tour around here when I was researching this book, uh, my wife stepped into that room <laughs> and she said, what my mother went on that, <laughs> um, but yeah, that it gives you an idea of uh, that was one of the smaller boats that went over. So there is a romantic story of little ships, and it, it, it you know Jersey owns that story. Um, th there is one living survivor, and I must tell you this: um, the the book came out, as you know. Paul, uh, just two weeks ago, yep. and instantly came out. My phone went, and it was the people from St. Helier Yacht Club saying, Oh, you've got to come over. The book's come out. You've got to come over. We're going to reenact the Somalo evacuation this weekend. Well, I couldn't get over for the weekend. And in fact, I'm, I'm pretty glad I did because one of the things in, in 1940, the little ships coming back got caught in a gale, which was not very comfortable for anyone on board. Um, <laughs> and they had one again, but they reenacted it. Uh, two weekends ago. But on the Monday, they had a, a lunch, <clears throat> which I did manage to make in St. Helier. And the one survivor, who was a nine-year-old girl um, at the time, said that the demolition crews were brought back. Well, they did pick up a few civilians as well. Uh, she's obviously now 90, 91, coming on 92. Uh, she was Jewish. Um, so you know, had an, her family had an imperative to try and get out of France. Um, and she was there. Um, and uh, she told her story, and she came back on one of those those little ships, and it was one. You know, I presented her a copy of the book, and it was, yeah, wonderful to meet her. Not least because I now have a nine year old Ukrainian refugee living with me, and it uh, just well, well, made well, her story feel more real. You know, it was just extraordinary. Well, so there are there is the romantic story um, of of the little ships. The other great disaster. Uh, in this June, mid-June period, of course, is the sinking of the Lancastria uh, at, at uh, Son Nazaire, at the mouth of the Loire estuary. Um, it was a major evacuation point. <clears throat> you know, they, they, they brought thousands of troops out already, and the ex-Cunard line of Lancastria were sent in, um, and an estimated 6,000 on board, and it was dive-bombed. And it sank within 20 minutes. Uh, the numbers are not precise. There were 2,477 recorded survivors. So around 4,000 were lost. It's Britain's largest maritime disaster. It dwarfs the Titanic. Um, 
And of course, uh, yeah, this is another one where there's a lot of debate, a lot of conspiracy theories as, you know, about cover-ups. People always talk of a D notice. Um, Churchill did say, <clears throat> when this landed on his desk, the news of this, that people had enough bad news for one day. And they had, because it was the very day that France announced that it was going to surrender but well, in the french terms was seek an armistice uh, but of course that as, as we know that was the germans insisted on complete surrender um because they wanted to humiliate the french um uh, you know, for uh, the end of the first world war and so, you know they made them sign the armistice in the same railway carriage so that was the bad news churchill had already had to convey to the british people um and um it, it, it's given rise to this idea that uh, the, there was a D notice imposed. Uh, I mean, there is, I've never found this D notice. They're, they're, all the D notices issue, issued during the war are published. They're all available in the National Archives. And there is not one that mentions the Lancastria. People often quote the first news of the Lancastria being um, broken in the American press um, several weeks later, um, on so it was sunk on the 17th of June, and the usual date is quoted as the 25th of July in the New York Times. But in fact, the first printed reports of the sinking were in the Essex Chronicle on the 28th of June. Um, and I, I just I just read you a quote from the um, the report. It, so it was the first hand uh, account from a survivor. A bullet grazed my head as I fell. Blood ran down my face and great waves rolled over me as I swam from the sinking ship. I found a piece of wreckage and clung to it. The ship was completely on her side. Hundreds of men clinging to her, singing, roll out the barrel and there'll always be in England. Two minutes later, less than 20 minutes from the start, she sank, taking those brave men with her hundreds in the water, picked up the song. Absolutely unthinkable that any British newspaper could have published that account in wartime if there was a D-notice. Yeah. Simply yeah. impossible. Absolutely impossible. I've been a journalist all my life. I've seen D-notices. I've been taken on tours of nuclear facilities where I've had to sign the Official Secrets Act. I, even in peacetime, I know how rigorously they are enforced. Now, why did Churchill not? In his memoirs, he, you know, he recounts this. Well, I, I, I said we shouldn't issue uh, the news because people had too much bad news. He, why didn't he correct that? I, because I don't think he was told, and I can't verify this. But the Minister of Information was Alfred Duff Cooper, a Conservative MP, who was actually never very comfortable in his role as a wartime censor and, and did resign that position um, not, uh, not long after. Uh, he was never comfortable. He, he didn't like the censorship of the, uh, of, of the press, but he obviously realised he had to do it. Um, another month later, these pictures were first published in, um, the, uh, in the War Weekly. They were taken by... Um, a storeman on HMS Highlander, Frank Clements. Now he was given permission to take a camera on board by by his by, by the captain of the ship, um, and there's no way that those pictures would ever have appeared in a British publication if they hadn't if the you know, the uh, Ministry of Information had not authorised their release. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah, there, there's no way that if there's a D notice in place, those pictures would have been appearing in wartime publications just a few weeks later. So I don't buy into the, you know, that there was a D notice. I think there was hesitation because there were reporters around the, all of the ports on the south coast picking up the stories. We know that the military personnel who survived were told not to talk about it. So there was clearly a hesitation. There was clearly a moment when there was a thought that there might be a D-notice issue, but it never was issued. The one other thing I would say about this is in all of the stories that were published in the British papers 
during the war, there is a remarkable consistency about the you know the the, the sink the story of the sinking, the the fact that the those who are standing on the ship and you can see, I mean it's a terrible terrible picture, isn't it? Because you know that within minutes that was going to roll over and they they were going to be taken to their deaths. They were singing, roll out the barrel and they'll always be in England. So I think there was some control by the Ministry of Information about the about the, the way the news was released and precisely what information was released. But um, people knew about it. Um, I think and... it to, just to add to my, my thoughts on that, David, is that when people think something's been covered up, these days there's automatically the idea that there's something sinister behind it. Mm. There's some kind of yeah. devious... And, and what, what it is is management of the public's ability to respond to things happening that are shit. You know, that's, you know, and Colin reminded us uh, that it's worth mentioning that at the same time is 804 servicemen were killed at Wren train station in Brittany when it was attacked by five Heinkel bombers. It's a story that Colin is my best mate here in Normandy. He goes and sees lots of football games down yeah. in Wren, sees a friend down there. He kind of discovered that story. I mean, we, we was reminded of that story on a visit there a little while ago. And it's another story that it wasn't, it wasn't suppressed. It was just there's only so much bad news the yeah. people of the world can hear at the same time. So mm. I don't think that if, if there is no cover up, there's just a sensitivity about mm. just releasing information at such a point mm. that it doesn't completely derail the, the, the morale. That, mm. And we talk a lot about that 1940 blitz spirit and it's that it's it's important. Britain and the and the rest of the yeah. world are watching Britain's reaction. If Britain starts crumbling internally because everybody's totally disenchanted, the, the, the country's in dire straits. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Paul. Um, yeah, the, you've got to remember that the, Dunkirk boosted the country's morale. And, you know, here we are trying to deal with what happened after Dunkirk. Yeah, we lost the Highland Division. You know, 10 days later, the you know, the worst maritime disaster in British history. Um, it, you know, it, it was going to puncture that that, that 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 boost in morale, which must have been very fragile at the time. It's very hard for us to imagine what it was like to you know to to live through that. But uh, you know, so there was the, there was clearly an element of news management. You know, yeah. you know the story about the you know, the, the bravery. Um, you know those people facing death, singing. You know that's um, yeah that, that clearly puts a, I guess say a positive. I mean, it's difficult to have, have a positive gloss on something, but I think you know what I mean. It, yeah, it, it, it paints a it, it makes you feel proud. It of, says of, of, that, pride, that, 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 that's the British spirit. You know, we're yeah. facing death, looking it in the eye. Yeah, um, I agree with you. Yeah, so, but you know, there are there are some legitimate um, issues still around the Lancastria. It is still not designated as a war grave, and you, know, you have to give full marks to you know, the relatives who are still campaigning for that to uh, that to be rectified because it should be rectified. Um, it, it should be a war grave, and uh, I hope one day they get that. There are still some calls for a formal inquiry. You know, why was it why was it overloaded? Well, cl clearly, sorry, gone. clearly it was overloaded. But frankly, Paul. Every blimmin' ship that left France but from the middle of May to the end of June 94 was overloaded. You know, we were just desperate to get as many people back as we possibly could. Yeah. Um, yeah so, yeah, I, that, that's yeah, why, why, and again, it, it's all in the book. I've tried to pull it apart a bit. Why, why did it sit outside for so long? It was waiting for an escort. Um, was that the right decision? I, look, I don't know, you know. These decisions are made by people in a difficult position. Just as one footnote, the captain of the Lancastria, who's often blamed by some people for delaying its departure, and said you can debate the rights and wrongs of that, he survived. He was then captain in, in 1942 off the coast of West Africa, the RMS Laconia, uh, which was torpedoed. Uh, he and he lost his life in that, um, and uh, so did 1600 other people. And it actually, that is the second largest maritime disaster in British history, uh, behind the Lancastria. Um, it's uh, not someone sh whose ship you wanted to be on in wartime, I think. Hmm. So, there's a wealth of great stories in the book, 
um, and, and I'm deeply grateful if there's anyone watching who sent me their relative stories. A huge, huge thank you because they're what bring this alive. I'm just going to pick out a couple. Um, <clears throat> Wild Jack Howard and Heavy Water. Heavy Water, um, as, as I expect most people know, was the essential precursor to developing nuclear weapons. Um, it had been developed in Norway um, by a rather tortuous route. It had ended, or the whole world's whole supply of heavy water had ended up in France. And um, obviously we were keen for this uh, to um, <laughs> stay out of German hands. So into the picture steps, the 20th Earl of Suffolk, Charles Henry George Howard. Uh, he became Earl of Suffolk when he was uh, just 11 years old after his father was killed in Baghdad in the, the First World War. He lived a colourful life, married an actress. He... Um, <clears throat> He'd been in the Scots Guards for a while. He'd been a sheep farmer in Australia. Um, he um, came back to the UK. He, he was obviously a very clever man. He studied chemistry and pharmacology at Edinburgh, um, passed with flying colours. And he ended up working with the British government in Paris at the outbreak of war and made it his mission to get the um, heavy water plus 600 tonnes of specialised engineering equipment and, might add, all of the, uh, the Belgian supply of uh, rough diamonds, over £100 million worth of rough diamonds, uh, back to the UK. Um, and his, his is a, a remarkable story. He got all of this stuff to Bordeaux. Um, so by now, the, the evacuation having initially said that La Rochelle would be used as the, the emergency evacuation point as the most southernmost port on the Biscay coast, we'd already moved further south to Bordeaux. We were, we were making this one up as we went along, and, they, and the naval planning was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, they, thunk, they, they thought on their, their feet, um, and um, they... Yeah, that's one reason why Operation Area was so successful. So he got um, he got these out. They got them out on a ship called the Broom Park. Um, and one of the things he did is he built. He was an incredibly resourceful man. A wooden ark on the on the deck of the ship, so that with all of this heavy water and these diamonds in it, so that if the ship was torpedoed and sunk. This could float off. Wow. <laughs> he was yeah, very resourceful. Oscar and Genevieve mentioned there, never far from his side. These, these, were, uh, these were not people. These were his pistols, which he'd acquired um, on his travels. We think they came, they picked them up when he was in Australia. He, he took them everywhere with him. He was never without them. He... He also walked with a limp um, and uh, usually used a, a, a walking stick. Um, and uh, one of the French scientists who he got out with him um, left a wonderful description of, uh, uh, he, of, of life on the, the Broom Park as it came back. There were seasick people. He, that's Mad Jack, was limping around the ship to treat them with champagne, <laughs> which he proclaimed to be the best remedy against seasickness. All this was completely in keeping with the ideas of British aristocracy I had gathered from the works of P.J. Woodhouse. Wow. I mean, he was an incredible character. He got back to the UK and he set himself up as a, a freelance bomb disposal team um, and was hugely successful. And one thing he did when he was, because uh, obviously the Germans were dropping all sorts of bombs we'd never seen before, he, um, he took his secretary with him um, and his chauffeur and his chauffeur's job was to have to hand down the right tools to the bomb crater. The secretary's job, and she'd been with him all the way through France, was to stand at the top of the crater as he dictated what he'd found in these new fuses, um, which obviously was absolutely invaluable. It, it wasn't the way that, that the normal bomb disposal squads work. And, I mean, they, and, and they were successful uh, dozens of times. 
inevitably it went wrong one day uh, with a bomb on Aerith Marshes and uh, it exploded and all three of them um, died. So yeah, he was um, he was quite a remarkable character. This is not the only secret story. Um, we had to get the poison gas out of France. We had a supply of poison gas because Churchill was convinced that Hitler would use poison gas and he was not squeamish about gas. Um, and so we had a supply in France which we had to get out before the Germans found it, uh, which we did. Um, there was also the Polish national treasures um, and, the, and the gold reserves from Poland. There were the, uh, uh, all of the, most of the contents of the Albanian treasury were in France as well. And we wow. got that. There's a, a, a mountain of colorful stories. I won't go I through this one. In, in We had a question from Phil Bosworth about the diamonds. Uh, industrial diamonds, I'm guessing, rather than dual dual diamonds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And where, where are they come from? Uh, Belgium, uh, Belgium, and Netherlands. I'm guessing, because all yeah, the, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Because yeah, I mean, yeah, they were, they were. The, that was the diamond capital of the world at the time. Yeah. Um, and obviously, they, again, they were a vital resource for us and something we didn't want in in German hands. As I said, I won't go through this in any detail, but it just gives you an idea of what was going on in the background, if you look at it, particularly the collapse of the, the French government, um, you know, you know, the, the uh, re replacement of Renault by Marshal Pétain, um, who you know, was, uh, he, uh, he, was a he, he was the hero of Verdun from the yep. First World War. Um, but, um, you know, he, 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 he was very old by this time and um, it was, was quite keen to, Give in as quickly as possible. De Gaulle broke away, um, as as people probably know. Um, come to that in a second. The armistice negotiations is you know, sort of key in the way the, the latter part of the evacuations flowed. They sought an armistice on the 21st of June, and it was signed the following day. To, and French, all the French units were um, ordered to surrender. Not all of them did. Um, by any means, um, you know, quite a lot of them wanted to carry on fighting. And then um, by this time, de Gaulle had, had, you know, he had briefly been in the French cabinet, but it, it divided um, and he fled to London. Um, and there's a wonderful story about how his family got out as well. Um, and uh, the, his, his favourite, uh, his famous broadcast, um, to the rallying broadcast of the French people, which was the beginning of the uh, formation of the Free French Forces. Of course, uh, you know, the dealings with France had a, uh, a controversial and tragic ending, which is uh, our attempts to get the French Navy to sail to, to UK ports. Some of it did, um, but most of it um, sailed to their, uh, their ports in North Africa. And as, as again, I suspect most people know, uh, we, um, we, we, in our attempts to persuade them to hand the, uh, their ships over to us rather than let them fall into German hands failed. So uh, we, we, we sank them with the, with the loss of 1,500 um, French sailors um, at Mirza Kabir and Oran. But um, <clears throat> that's a sort of footnote to the story. But it, you know, it's important to understand where it ended, the division of France. And, of course... You, you can see there that the Germans wanted the coast. They desperately wanted the coast, which is why you know the the, the demolition that went on in those ports was so important. Um, so what were the final stages? Um, France surrendered, but we continued the evacuations, and they eventually moved south to the the Spanish border, right to Saint Jean de Luz. Um, they there were many crossings over by by land over the. Uh, Spanish border, um, people getting to Portugal or to Gibraltar to, to be brought home. Um, all th th there were quite a large expat community on the, the, the French Riviera, including the author Somerset Maughan, who, who left a wonderful account he published uh, just after the war, which I've, I've, I have qu quoted from in, in, in the book about uh, his story. In fact, he ended up on a former collier, uh, a coal ship, um, and it, it, it took three weeks because it went from um, it went from from Nice to North Africa to Gibraltar 
before it finally set sail um, back to back to England. Um, and I said it took three weeks, and that wasn't uncommon. There were quite a few of those ships didn't didn't arrive back until to the middle of August. Uh, and he recounts the the, the story um, of uh, his um, his journey on this collier, which they'd attempted to clean of coal dust, but had uh, completely failed. And uh, how they uh, how they struggled, and you know there are the stories of refugees who. Um, across the Spanish border in the book as well. Um, so, flipping over, the, we've looked at briefly at some of the, the French ports involved. These were the British ports uh, that received the, um, the ships coming back from France as part of Operation Aerial and Operation um, Cycle as well. The numbers there <clears throat> are the military evacuees right they never counted the civilians so even if there was a ship with a mixture of military personnel and civilians they meticulously counted the number of military personnel whether they were navy air force army uh, whether they were french british czech polish belgium whatever it's all meticulously recorded, and the records just say, and a number of civilians. So you have to guess up to you know, a little point, up to a point, as how many civilians came back. Falmouth and was the main that, reception was point. Because the military thought someone else would be cataloguing the civilians. Or, I mean, yeah. it, it just doesn't make any sense why they wouldn't at least give the number, you know. Because yeah. it's there, there was just, just no records kept. They, they, they were just keen to move them through as quick as possible because obviously they wanted to get the military personnel to you know to, to the right places so they could rejoin their units um, uh, or, or reform units if, if that was what was necessary and uh, yeah and there was a quite a meticulous plan put in place uh, for dealing with the, the, you know, the military evacuees there was that you know the, the civilian evacuees, I, I think they were slightly surprised at how many there were, to be honest. But right. you know, there was a, you know, there were fleets of trains waiting at the stations at these ports, and they, you know, they they just put them on there. There, are, some of them sometimes had to spend a couple of days in Falmouth, in particular. The weather was very kind. That's a picture of how crowded Falmouth Harbour was, um, with ships waiting to dock and disembark their passengers. Yeah, you know, there were people slept in the parks. Um, there were people put up in, you know, people a bit like today with the Ukrainian refugees. People owned their houses and 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 put people up until um, they could they could find somewhere to you know to um, to, to live for the rest of the war. There there were twenty six thousand Channel Island evacuees, um, very large number of them children particularly from Guernsey. Guernsey evacuated almost all of its children. Uh, Jersey was a, a, a little bit more divided on um, uh, whether people should leave or stay. So uh, um, there's a, a bit more of a mixed population left there. But they're the military evacuees. They're the ports they came into. Um, <clears throat> a bit on the numbers here. Um, operation cycle was 15,500. You can read the numbers here. I won't read them out for yeah, people. We just have a question about how many Polish and how many Czech came out. So yeah. there, it all is right there for you folks. Yeah. There were two very large Polish divisions and a chunk of the Polish Air Force. Um, there were quite a few French came back. Um, to Obviously, they, they joined de Gaulle and became the, the nucleus of the free French forces. Czechs, Belgians, and uh, if, so if you add the Channel Islands refugees with those fleeing France, over 50,000. Um, yeah, I agree with that comment there. It's staggering logistical triumph, isn't it? However you look at it, you know. The... Well, I mean, we'll, we'll touch on this when we come to the end it's soon, but yeah, it, it, why this sits so far behind in the shadow of Dynamo, I don't understand. I mean, to me, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, we talk about teams doing a double in one year. They win the league and the FA Cup. This should be up there on equal oh, footing with Dynamo. It should, yeah. The public should be aware of it being Dynamo and, and Ariel side by side as two. But it's it's just pretty yeah. much dropped from the conventional understood narrative, which yeah. is which is crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, they're comparable in size and scale. And Operation Ariel was phenomenally complex. I mean, writing about it was a real challenge. I mean, there was a time, Paul, but having told myself I'm going to fill the gap um, because I think, you know, someone needs to bring the military histories, the naval history, and weave into that the civilian stories. There, there was a time when I thought... Yeah, Wolf's fold, you're bonkers. <laughs> this is too bloody complicated. You know, Dunkirk is an easy story to tell because it, it you can tell it chronologically and geographically. It all funnels into one port. This 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 moved, and all of these evacuations from the different ports all overlapped with each other. So it's a really complex story, you know, and com and a complex operation and a phenomenal yeah. logistical <laughs> triumph. Did it have its mastermind? I mean, we often talk about Ramsey in terms of Dynamo. I mean, I'm guessing because you said yourself it's from so many different ports and so yeah. many different areas. There, it can't be one single guy. You know, no, no there, were, there were two principal yeah. naval commanders. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they have to take the, uh, the lion's share of the, of the credit. But, uh, you know, also, you know, Carl's Lake, Fontainebleau, the commanders of the lines in of communication troops. I mean, their, their skill in reorganizing uh, the troops that were there. Well, I haven't mentioned it here, but they, um, a lot of those people who thought they were, you know, the, the backroom staff, if you like, suddenly find themselves reorganized into to, to, to a frontline division. There was one very large division called the Bowman Division, which was put under the uh, command of, uh, of Archibald Bowman. It was actually interesting that for those of you you know, interested in the the long background in military history, it was the first uh, British uh, division named after a commanding officer since the Peninsular Wars, um, and he did a fantastic job in you know in in turning these lines of communication troops into something resembling um, a, a fighting unit. But the naval commanders you know, must take a, a lot of the a lot of the credit too. Um, do, do we have an idea how much you say there's substantial amounts of equipment? I'm guessing it's because you just don't know uh, yeah. the amount. To just to address that for a second, it's amazing how often you read in books when the BEF left France, they left quote all its equipment behind end quote, and and the fact whatever amount it is that was taken out in aerial, it means that that leaving behind everything is simply a fallacy. Yeah, I mean, in in uh, it happened in Dynamo, you know, because if, yeah. if the whole thing happened so quickly, uh, you know, I imagine that my father, when he drove his lorry in the road to Dunkirk, was amongst those who had to uh, to, to wreck its engine. Um, that, I mean, there are no precise figures right from the start um, of cycle and aerial in particular there was an emphasis put on trying to bring back as much equipment as possible. Um, now, people can read in the book, you know, there, there are mixed accounts of how successful that was. There are stories which are comparable to the Dynamo stories of large amounts of equipment having to be destroyed, you know, thrown over cliffs, um, you know, en engines wrecked and so on. But quite clearly, because they were using deep water ports, they were able to send large ships in and they did bring out quite a lot of equipment. Um, was it totally successful in the objective of you know, bringing out the amount that they want? I, I doubt it. You know, there, there was but clearly it but it was better than nothing. As you made the point, David, it was things like the industrial dynam uh, diamonds and the and the heavy water. That's the that's the long term. You know, rescuing a few half broken down Bedford trucks is not going to help win the war. Industrial mm -hmm. diamonds. And David O'Keefe made a comment in the sidebar about how diamonds become incredibly important in the Arctic convoys to Russia as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe mm -hmm. some of those very di uh, diamonds that came out of France were then mm -hmm. sent to Russia for them to to, to, to arm their industry. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what you're saying is, and I think what we're all we're all taking on board is, Dynamo is 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 a very organised human rescue mission, mm. whereas it's a, a, a equally well organised but more complicated system is in it that is bringing both personnel, military and civilians, and stuff we will need in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, and and troops that we needed as well. So, yeah, you, you add all those. 
the 200 and plus thousand British troops that came back through Dynamo, you know, that, that's a considerable fighting force that was repatriated. A, a couple of things. Um, the, the ships that were lost, the Lancastria wasn't the, the only one uh, by any means. Ones I just do want to finish with um, before opening up to any other questions that you and your viewers have got are the hospital ships. Um, one, the hospital ship Paris was sunk at Dunkirk on the 2nd of June. And as you can see from the, the picture at the bottom there, I mean, hospital ships were, were, were bloody distinctive. Yeah, there's, there's no mistaking that for a hospital ship. Uh, and two were sunk at Dieppe. Um, Dieppe was designated as the medical evacuation point, and this had been agreed with the Germans. And, um, you know, although, you know the, the, and they had respected that. Um, and unfortunately, um, a movement uh, officer um, cocked up um, and one night, because the, a lot of the railway lines have been you know, damaged, moved a troop train through the centre of Dieppe, which obviously the German reconnaissance plane spotted. And they took that as an indication that we had um, broken the, the rules about it being a, a Red Cross agreed um, uh, and designated medical evacuation point. Uh, consequently, the, the following day, they bombed it and two hospital ships were, were lost. I just want to leave you because one of the great finds when I was researching this was a file of letters from nurses, handwritten letters from nurses in the National Archives, um, which I, I, a great, I think is a great privilege to be, to be able to give these the, the publicity they deserve. And I just want to quote from, from one of them. Uh, they, they were asked to, after the evacuations finished, they were asked to write their experiences um, and send them to the, um, uh, the, the, the chief uh, the, of the Queen Alexandra's Nursing Corps, which, which they did. Um, Got to remember, some of these nurses, these hospital ships went back five or six times during Dynamo and Ariel. You know, they, they went... They they bought you know, shipped the, the wounded back and the, the numbers are far greater than those shown in the official records because the, the records for the ships if, if you add those up there are thousands more wounded than um, uh, uh, appear in the official account so they went back time and time again and this is uh, this is one of them Sister Dora Grayson who was on the Isle of Guernsey the hospital ship to Dunkirk. The German plane returned and dived backwards and forwards, dropping, they said, 10 salvos of three bombs each and machine gunning all the time. One cannonball went straight through the foremast at the level of the bridge, which proved that the pilot must have been low enough to see all five large red crosses. Just as we'd given up all hope of survival, an RAF plane came down and drove off the Germans. Captain of the Dinard, um, another hospital ship, wrote this. During all of this, our nurses were really splendid. Never a sign of excitement nor panic of any kind. They just carried on under the able leadership of our matron, calmly and efficiently. And I feel quite sure that their magnificent behaviour was an important factor in steadying up the members of the RAMC, the Royal Army Medical Corps, personnel with whom they worked. There's a captain saying it was the, it was the nurses, the women who provided you know, the, the stoical care of the wounded and that uh, the young doctors on, the bo on board those ships took their lead from the nurses. Oh, it's incredible. And they went back time and time again. The records say, you know, they got in you know, to Southampton, they unloaded the wounded, they cleaned the ship, they turned around and they went back again. Wow. And I think that's, uh, you know, I, I, I just think that's, yeah, it's such, such a privilege to be able to share those stories at long last. No, definitely. Some people are asking about where they can get them, and the simple answer is in your book. Um, yeah. But um, we'll, do, we'll deal with a couple of questions. David O'Keefe is making the point that those hospital ships sunk were taken into account in Jubilee because they partially blocked the entrance to the harbour. So there's something how they came back to influence things in 1952. Um, yeah. 
Robbie from on uh, military his with his military history channel is asking about how the defense of some of the French ports was organized while the evacuations were going taking place. Were there kind of any kind of last ditch stands to kind of keep Germans away? Yes, there were. Um, and I've got, I've got a couple of accounts from ordinary soldiers, uh, the, the, which uh, their families very kindly shared with me. You know, the, the poor sod that was always chosen to, um, you know, to, 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 to form the, um, you know, the defensive line. Um, and, uh, yeah, but actually the, the one in the book got out, I think that was, I think he got out through Brest, but, uh, yeah, they, they did. We tried to defend the ports as, as best we could. The French also, you know, many of the ports did help try to defend them, even if they were reluctant to let us blow them up. Um, they, you know, these, it was a fast moving situation, but, uh, and, and again, there were stories there of, you know, People were told to go to one port, but found it had already fallen and had to turn around and go, go south to another one. Um, you know, the uh, uh, you know, the, we we tried our best to yeah. stall the Germans for as long as possible, to get as many people out as possible, and to give us the best chance of uh, of, of denying the Germans quick and easy access to quality port facilities. Brilliant. Uh, Ori Chilman is asking about the RAF cover, and I, and I know obviously it's going to be covered t to some extent in the book there. But uh, yeah, there, this is one of the things that came up in the sidebar in May and June. The RAF are doing a lot, trying to do an awful lot of things in an awful lot of different places. So, as with the Lancaster, they weren't always in the right place at the right time, but they're mm. stretched paper thin. But the RAF cover obviously is an important aspect of this. Yeah, I mean. It, it, it... It comes up in Dynamo as well, and uh, it was so great that the, the most recent film about Dunkirk actually you know, featured um, the, the, the you know the story of the of the RAF pilot because uh, you know, the, the the troops on the beaches there often re, uh, you know, recorded as complaining that uh, you know the RAF weren't to be seen. Well, of course they were trying to stop the German planes getting to the beaches. They were trying to stop them getting to the ports. They were much less use. Once they were over the the, the ports, uh, because uh, the you know, the Germans were doing their worst. But I mean, as, as I suspect you know, Paul, they we we had to we had to bring them back because you know, we needed them you know for for the Battle of Britain. Um, you know, we couldn't afford to lose the RAF in in France. So in the first part of the evacuations in in area yes there there seems to be a reasonable amount of RAF coverage you can see from, you know, from the the nurses account it, it it diminished as they as they went on um and you know only was left to you know to the navy to to, to escort to the ships as as best they could to prevent you know particularly to protect them against attack from u boats no, brilliant stuff. And we're, and we're being reminded that Dr. Alexander Clark did a good show on his YouTube channel the, in detail about the naval side of things. As we said at the beginning, we, we, every one of these aspects, we could go down another half an hour discussion, oh. you know, going down. We've done a fantastic overview on this. So it's, so it's really good. Um, have you, we've got one more slide, I think, haven't you? Um, only to, um, I need to mention the book. Yeah, yeah, this is important. Um, been asking about about the book obviously the, the, the saber storm publishing is is where the book is available direct for the publisher obviously it's available in your local bookshops and what have you and whatever online source you want and it came out was it two weeks ago david yeah literally two weeks ago yeah yeah and also if people are interested on uh, channel five select and you i'm pretty sure it's still on the website they did do um an episode on dunkirk and what happened after which i'm on um, and it, it's got some of the these stories in in there as well. Um, and people will probably be interested in that. Well, brilliant. I mean, it's it, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. This show it has covered it in in enough detail to get people interested. Uh, but accepting the fact we could have gone down lots of the uh, rabbit holes on it. But um, yeah, people have enjoyed it. And um, at some point in the future, we can invite you back. But is are you going to carry on in military history? I mean, obviously, you did. The, you say your 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 wife's grandfather's story, but is are you, is this something that's getting under your skin, and you want to do more of this? Yeah, I think so. I and mean, I think there. Are, I mean, you know, I've delved quite deeply into this area, and I think there are two um, there are two stories that come out of it that that I'd like to explore more. One is where I finished. Um, I, th I think the story um, of the medical services 
through the whole um, British expeditionary force period from you know, October 1939 when they were first sent to when when the last um, uh, doctors and nurses were brought back at the end of June. I, I, th I think that's something that is, is worth telling. And obviously, there's some of that in my earlier book, Fighting for the Empire, because you know, he was a doctor. He was, a, you know, and he's won the DSO in the First World War and so on. So you know, I've, I've got a, an insight into that. I think that's a story that deserves greater airtime. The other one that tempts me to explore more is, it, it, it is Jack Howard. Um, you know the Earl of Suffolk. Mm. Uh, there is there is one reasonable biography, but the, the problem is that um, and the Channel Five people found this as well that the family of not um, they've not opened up any family records. Um, I, I I I think I'm going to approach them. I, I'm going to see if I can get access to anything that hasn't been published because that would make it really worthwhile doing a decent uh, biography um, of him. There, I said there is there is one there's one pretty good one around, but it's it's all based on you know second hand material because Yeah, um, no, it, 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 it yeah. deserves that thorough yeah. going back to the archives and the, so, yeah. And the sources, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, there are more a couple, but I, I you know I think the medical services are sort of there's a chapter in the book on them and it only scratches the surface. Brilliant. Well, well, we'll invite you back in the future. I'm just going to take you off screen for a second to remind people what you've got coming up tomorrow. So, folks, tomorrow evening or afternoon, depending on where you are, Michael Ackerman is joining me for a show about the German defences in Vierville, Samir, on Omaha Beach. So, Vidas there, 70, 71, 72, May Touch, 73. So, he has, if you've been following him on Facebook, he's prolific in creating graphic images with his art talent of what the defences there were set up like. He's just been really, really thorough going through information about German photos, French photos, plans, things like that. So it'll be a definitive, not a definitive, but a really, really good, near to definitive explanation about what those defences were on the western end of Omaha Beach. So I'm really looking forward to that one. And then next week we have Animals at War Week and a couple of other red random shows before I go away for a couple of weeks and won't be able to be back till the end of July when we're doing Operation Cobra and various other things like Operation Spring, Verrier Ridge, we're going to do that, that story there. So I'm going to bring David back in just to say goodbye, really. So that was really good. I enjoyed that. Okay. Did you enjoy talking to our group of people? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I share your view. It's a story that needs to be told. It should sit alongside Dynamo, not be absolutely. hidden underneath it. Um, so yeah, being able to share it with people is, is always an enormous pleasure. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you for those that have been kind enough to uh, tune in. No, thank you. And you know what to do, folks. Go and get that book so you can expand your knowledge of this operation because everyone knows about Dunkirk, but this it needs to have those several books side by side because that's how history should recall them. So there we are. I, I'm going to end now. So this is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV. So I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for watching. Bye.